So I think we go ahead and get started. Thank you all for joining us today. A big welcome and hello to everybody for our webinar. The webinar topic today is Secure GitHub Pipelines for Kubernetes. And we have with us today our friends from SNCC. And I would like to share a few housekeeping items up front. So please note that this call is being recorded and all of the participants are in listen only mode. If you would like to ask questions, please use the Q&A panel and we will address those at the end of the presentation. So it is my pleasure now to introduce to you our panelists. So we have today with us Simon Maple, Director of Developer Relations at SNCC and Brice Fernandez, our Customer Success Engineer here at Reefworks. Simon, would you like to introduce yourself briefly? Hi there, yeah, sure. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much for having me on. Uh, my pleasure to be here. Um, I'm uh, one of the developer advocates, uh, part of the DevRel team at SNCC. And uh, my background is actually as an engineer uh, back in the day when I was working at IBM, working on WebSphere for 12 years or so. And uh, I moved into developer relations in 2012. And uh, previous to joining SNCC, I was at a company uh, called Zero Turnaround, who was doing more and more uh, Java uh, performance, uh, sorry, Java performance testing as well as Java uh, productivity tooling for developers. And um, about a year ago, just over a year, about a year and a week maybe, I joined SNCC. Um, and uh, it's one of my great passions, open source as well as, uh, you know, it, providing developers with developer first tooling. And uh, it, was a, it was a natural fit for me to join SNCC. Uh, I'm a big kind of community advocate as well. So I, I run uh, a number of communities, including the Virtual Java User Group, uh, the London Jug, uh, and more recently, one of the SNCC communities with uh, Sam Hepburn, uh, the Secure Developers. So uh, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff that I do, as you can see from my uh, speaker intro there, including a whole bunch of presenting and lots of lots of travel away from home very often. Um, but uh, but yeah, I enjoy I enjoy going out, seeing people, speaking to people as well as spending time home with the family. Awesome. Thank you so much. And um, Breeze, would you like to give us the pleasure? Introduce yourself. Sure. Um, so welcome. Uh, I'm Breeze. I'm one of the essentially customer engineers at Weaveworks. So I moved over from uh, product, product development into kind of helping our customers with Kubernetes, uh, with securing pipelines, with architecture uh, for more recent work. I've been working with a lot of um, people in the kind of regulated industries, figuring out how to get their pipelines secure. Uh, so that's bank and healthcare. Uh, and hopefully you can uh, learn some of the things we've had to build today. Awesome, thanks so much. And I think Brice, you will start us off, correct? Then I will hand it over to you. Yeah, that's right. So uh, let me Perfect. share my screen and uh, see whether we can get that uh, sorted. All right, off to you. So let me know whether you can see the entire page here, the web page. Uh, is that coming out okay, uh, Sonia? Yeah. Yeah, looks Perfect. good. Thank you. Let me move to uh, our, um, our presentation. So maybe I'll start off with a little bit of an introduction about Weaveworks, the company. Uh, so Weaveworks has been uh, doing basically open source Kubernetes and open source uh, products since 2014. Uh, we've got quite a strong presence in the Kubernetes uh, ecosystem. Uh, we've uh, worked on things like KubeADM, which is a Kubernetes installer. Uh, that's an open source Kubernetes installer. We also wrote uh, EKS Scuttle, which is the default way of installing Kubernetes now on EKS. That's the one that's uh, recommended by the standard official documentation, uh, our open source project. Uh, we're one of the founding members of the CNCF. Uh, until very recently, our uh, CEO was actually the uh, chair of the Technical Oversight Committee. Uh, that's the group within the CNCF that's responsible for accepting projects. Uh, he's now still on the committee. He got re-elected, but he's no longer the chair to do the handover. Um, and, and we've really been running Kubernetes for uh, a while now, four years on, I think, uh, is that's about right. Um, and really, we developed some approaches for developing Kubernetes, for developing on Kubernetes, which we've called collectively GitOps. And um, that's some of the things we're going to be talking to you about today. Uh, and in terms of what we do, in terms of what we do commercially, besides our open source work, uh, we sell a lot of um, Kubernetes tools. We have uh, a platform to help you manage. Uh, your Kubernetes clusters, uh, that's for your developers and your operators. Uh, we also do some on enterprise and on-premise platforms for Kubernetes, uh, and as well as a whole bunch of professional services like training and consultancy, architecture review, et cetera. So that's where we've worked. I start from the top of this slide. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so yes, SNCC is, uh, they're a three-year-old startup now. Uh, they're based in Tel Aviv and London and Boston and also a number of different remote locations. And um, we are a, we, we are a developer-friendly, developer-first tool that detects open source vulnerabilities in um, third-party dependencies. Um, we don't just find them, but we'll also provide fixes for them and also monitor them so that people will be alerted as and when uh, vulnerabilities or, or um, you know, issues in, in your code or your, your um, dependencies um, are going to affect your application. And uh, it, we essentially provide a shift left kind of tool that allows developers to have the ability to, to um, to, to fix issues before they get anywhere near production. So we try and find and fix uh, security vulnerabilities in your dependencies during development. And we have a number of different uh, uh, customers already from many, many different locations, in fact, many, very different verticals um, who, uh, who are all, all uh, you know, helping, us, uh, helping us build this product and helping, uh, we're helping them to be secure every day. Brilliant. Um, so thanks, Simon. Um, really, I, I think we can get straight into it and start talking about the topic in particular. Um, so really, I want to start talking about uh, CI/CD pipelines. And one of the things that we wanted to, to talk about during this webinar was how do you create a secure CI/CD pipeline? Um, and the operational approach we've developed over a few years to enable us to do that uh, with kind of less overhead than you usually would. So the first thing is, um, let's take a look at the typical CI CD pipeline, particularly how it relates to uh, plugging to cloud native clusters, Kubernetes clusters. So what we have here is a pretty typical pipeline and we'll start at the left. So you have the developer who has read write credentials to the code repository, which, which is kind of expected. Um, and then you have the uh, CI system. So you have the code repository, then the CI system uh, who is read, reads the code repository for updates. Uh, creates a new entity, writes that new entity into the container uh, registry, and then also has the, the code uh, to talk to the cluster API to modify the cluster itself so that you can de de deploy a new version or deploy a new set of configuration files from your CI pipeline. Uh, so that's very typical. And then the uh, developer might have re write credentials to push images uh, to the container registry as well. We've definitely seen that in some environments where the developers had permissions direct to push directly to the container registry. So one of the problems here is, is you know, you are crossing security boundaries and the credentials required to make modifications to both the container registry and the cluster are basically spread everywhere. So what we're offering is a different model of doing this. And this is model that's uh, based on a set of configuration files kept in Git, which is why it's called the GitOps model. And so the GitOps model is kind of an operations model. It's how you operate your uh, infrastructure, in particular cloud native infra infrastructure. Um, it's also kind of derived from computer science and operations knowledge. This is kind of hard earned knowledge we've, which we've built over the last few years. It's kind of technology agnostic. Um, we, we'd love to you know, say you, you, you need to use our tool and our tools are great. You know, they, they work really well with that approach, but it's not really about Git and it's not really about tools. It's more about the approach and how you think about managing your system. You know, it's about the set of principle. It's why you do things, not just how you do them. Um, and obviously there are vendors like ourselves who can help you with how, but really it's about why. The approach is about why. So the first thing kind of you get in your mind is you to move towards that um, kind of golden state of removing the control from uh, the, the ability to modify the system, really, to control the, the, the system, is you need your entire system to be de declared. Uh, that's decri described declaratively. You need your entire system to be declared. Uh, and this is kind of beyond code. This is not necessarily just infrastructure as code as a bunch of shell scripts. This is infrastructure as code as a bunch of declarations, uh, which is implementation independent, very easy to abstract, and easy to validate for correctness. Uh, and it's obviously very easy to manipulate and generate from code, right? From within the first six weeks of you learning to, of a developer learning to program, uh, they'll be reading and writing structured data, which is what we're talking about here. Uh, the second kind of thing that you want to do uh, to your pipeline is to have the canonical state of your system. That's the desired state. This is what you choose your system to look like. That should be versioned in Git. Now you've declared it. Now you should put it in Git, and that should be versioned. That's quite an important step. 
Um, and that gives you a lot of emergent properties with the previous one, right? It's a canonical source of truth about your system. It's, it makes rollbacks trivial. Um, because rollbacks are now a git revert, you're moving from one state to the other. So essentially what you're doing is you're creating transactions, right? The combination of a declaration plus versioning means that you essentially have a, a transaction on your system. Uh, and we'll come back to that from the security angle a little bit later. Um, and, and that gives you like having that structure and having the control in your repository means that you have a really, really good guarantees for auditing. Um, so most um, most mutation of your system that use say cube cut all uh, to have a tra to track what's actually happened with your system, uh, you really need to just read through the logs, and that's a very difficult experience. In this case, you remove that access and you control everything through the repository, which means that you have a really good log of what happened and when and who, when and who did it and why. Uh, and it's, it, it allows very sophisticated approval processes. So if you wanted to build automated and manual approval, create workflows where humans have to approve a release, which is very common in regulated industries, um, then you can do that by having that part of the, the workflow with Git. And we already have these things most developers are very familiar with uh, reviewing a pull request, for example. So when reviewing a pull request becomes um, reviewing a pull request on your infrastructure or your, or your cluster, it becomes very, very easy to build these controls into the process. Just like we build, for example, a sneak um, review of the code into the CI, the automated pipeline on a, pull, on a pull request so that you can have sneak deny a pull request from being merged if it doesn't meet some properties. And finally, it's a great software and human collaboration point. So you have your software defined, you have your system defined in the declaration that can be read by a machine, uh, that's versioning Git, but that's also very readable and very accessible for humans. So now you can have humans and software collaborating on m monitoring and operating your system, which is very good. Um, the third bit is you want these changes to be applied continuously. You want the continuous loop around your system so that whenever there is a change in the desired state, your system changes to match. Uh, and that doesn't really help you with security per se, but it does make things go a lot faster. Um, the separation of what to do and how to do it, uh, letting an agent inside your cluster and having the software decide how to do something, uh, the software that's inside the security boundary, uh, that does help because it means that the privilege never leaves the security boundary of your cluster. And, and I'll show you a picture of that in a little bit. And finally, you want software agents to ensure correctness. Uh, so that if anything goes out of sync, you have a built-in alerting system. Uh, so like if your system diverges from your golden state that's in the Git repository, you'll have software agents that will trigger uh, alerts, um, which means the system can self heal right? If, it's, if it doesn't match the expectations, the, the agents themselves can reapply, reinforce those expectations. Um, so the system can self heal And it's a really, really good way of avoiding a certain class of error, which is a, a user makes a mistake. So I, I call these problem exists between keyboard and chair errors, operator errors, essentially. Okay, so now we've got this in mind. Let's take a look at what that um, looks like in practice. This is a very high level view. You've got a canonical source of truth. You've got people and software modifying that canonical source of truth. And then you have agent applying that source of truth into your cluster. So now you've done that, you have now a canonical desired state store, which is in your repository, right? You've got this config repository. Now, I see a lot of questions coming up and mentioned in, in the chat. Just note that while presenting, uh, the person presenting can't see the questions. So I'll jump on those as soon as I, I step out of presentation. Uh, but so we've got this GitOps pipeline. We have this config repository. This is your canonical state. And immediately we start seeing things like, for example, the permissions to change the cluster exist only within the cluster, right? They never leave the, the boundary of the cluster. Um, the actual agent that's modifying and mutating your cluster is the deploy agent that now lives inside of it. So the credentials to make change never leave the boundary of your secure garden, your walled garden. Uh, instead, what you do is you, you react to the outside world. So it's now your cluster reacting and changing to the outside world, but in a very structured way, in a very formalized way that you can control and manage. Uh, and then the operator might make changes to that repository. Uh, and then the system will react to changes to that repository. And the idea here is that you can create a set of constraints and processes around those changes to your repository uh, so that you, you never really have a case where um, uh, somebody's making a change to your cluster through the CI pipeline 
or you never have a, a state whereby your system is, is in an inconsistent state. Because we can now think of transactions, your system is never left in a state where you don't know what's going on. Uh, that's actually the biggest risk with traditional way of automated automation, is that instead of um, having a declaration of what you desire, you have a set of steps to take, and that set of steps to take can go wrong in the middle, and if it does, you will not know what's uh, happened. Uh, you won't know the state of your system. It'll be inconsistent. So the idea here is we're moving from consistent state to consistent state, and we're controlling those changes through the Git repository. And, and we have really good auditing and attribution, right, in Git, uh, mostly. So I'll, I'll give a quick demo of kind of what that looks like in practice, and then we'll jump into, okay, if, uh, if where's the security focus is should now move to, essentially, where, where the security focus is... Uh, as transferred to. So let me switch to my browser and let me jump into my, um, my environment and I'll do a deploy and then I'll show you the commit that's been created and the, and the log that's been created out of that. So, so this, is, um, this is our product, but really it's not, that's not why it's useful. Um, I don't think it's all that, it's, it's, not, it's, it's nice, but that doesn't, the information there is also available if you use open source tool or other tools, right? Because everything is driven through Git. So in this example, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna update this deployment, this front-end deployment. So I'm gonna create a new release, and you can also already see the history right here. And so this is taking you through the kind of the pipeline that would happen. So you've got the developers have pushed, put an image into a image registry. The image registry information is now collected and we are, have it available. So if I go back to the resources, if I'm going a little bit too fast, let me show the front-end. So this list here is taken from the image registry. We're, we're kind of collecting metadata from the image registry, including kind of the image names and IDs and um, shards. And then we're using that to create a list of the possibilities of configure, configuring your system, which image, which version is being released. So right now what I'm doing is I'm releasing a new version. And you might say, well, there's a gap in that security story because you don't know whether that's a good version and that version is secure. And I would say you're absolutely right. And this is exactly what Simon is going to be talking about a little bit later, about how do you secure that pipeline? How do you make sure that what you're actually releasing is correct? We're essentially looking at the security here of once you have an artifact, how do you structure the presentation of that artifact into your system? So let me press release. Um, so what we'll do, what will happen here is they'll, they're going to be two messages. The first one is us changing the state of our system. And the second one is the system reacting, reacting to that change. And we can see the two messages right here. So let's take a look at this, um, at this git commit that we've made. So we've now made a git commit to our control repository. It says flux, we flux, uh, as committed 21 seconds ago. You can see the changes I've made to the system. Because the entire system is encoded, we can see exactly what I did. Because the master branch is protected, there's no way of me changing the system without going through a PR process and leaving a trail and leaving a trail of approval. Uh, one thing that Git, uh, GitHub does not do very well here is it doesn't show you the committer and author uh, separately in the UI. But it turns out that the committer is Reflux, that's the software agent, but the author is me, Brees Fernandez. That's the person who's logged in uh, to the user interface. Or it would be whoever created the commit. And that's it, and, and now we have a new version running on our, on, on our cluster. You can see that the pods are transferring across. It takes a little bit of time to deploy four pods and make sure they're all healthy and running. But that's the idea. The idea, you, every time you make a change, you're leaving a trail. First thing you do, whatever happens is you change the desired state and then that triggers an automated update of your system. And if I go back to resources now, we should see that the front end is now back to green, right? It's back up to date to the latest version. So that's a, that's a taste, I guess, of um, how do you deploy your system through GitOps. So now we've pushed all the focus of control, right? Controlling actions into the, into the, re, in the, the repository. So now we need to secure that repository. We really need to secure that repository uh, because that's where all the control is happening. So um, how do you do that? How do you ensure that your repository is secure? So there are some really good resources. Um, we've, we wrote a paper recently called Hardening Git for GitOps, and there's been some other parties that have written secure GitOps in production. Either one of those will give you a really good idea of 
how to secure your system. Uh, and I'm sure Tan uh, Sonia will follow up with some additional information in the post webinar email with some links to those papers as well. But I'll kind of give a brief summary here of some of the actions you can take, some kind of concrete steps you can take to ensure that your, your Git uh, repositories are now secure. So the first thing you want to ensure is you mitigate user impersonation. You want to make sure that uh, uh, um, attribution isn't broken. Uh, so you, you, the one thing that you can do and, and really should do is to ensure strong identity uh, using GPG signed commits. Now, I'm not saying you should sign every commit, but quite likely what you'll want is you'll want to sign, you'll want to have a human verifier that verifies changes and signs off every PR, not necessarily every commit, every PR, to ensure that that's been verified by a human and somebody who, can, who you can attribute the decision to has chosen to move this into your system. Um, if you're going to be using GPG, use physical GPG keys or PGP keys. Uh, you can get tokens really cheap now, a matter of $10 or so, and you'll get a physical hardware token that you can plug into your laptop that makes the entire process so much easier. Um, and once you've got that, uh, that infrastructure, uh, then you also want to do things like run GPG validation code in CI, right? If you're going to be building those commits and you're going to be signing them, make sure you've got some validation in your CI pipeline that validates those things too. What, one of the worries is um, what happens if, a, if kind of a malicious or accidental a history rewrite, so if you change history. So uh, the first thing you can do is just prevent that. You can hard prevent that at your um, provider level. Essentially, if you go into GitLab, GitHub, Git itself, um, if you're running your own kind of centralized point of control, then you can force and force that the, the branch can be changed in the past, right? You can't change history. Uh, the past is unchangeable, it's immutable. And you can make, you can enforce that. So make sure you've, you've turned that flag on for whatever project you've got. And back up your repositories. Uh, it's trivial to do in Git because every person who's cloned has a backup. So there's absolutely no excuse to make those backup, have those available for comparison. Um, and you can do things like have a, a read-only backup that's available to some of your verification tools so that they can verify that the commit ID match uh, so that if somebody rewrites history, somebody bypasses the protections, then that will not match. The, the two won't match with the read-only backup you have. Um, the next step is, you know, all this kind of relies on some of the constraints you have on the security features for your Git provision provider. Um, so one way to kind of enforce and um, strengthen your provider is to actually configure it through infrastructure as code. So you apply GitOps to the GitOps provision as well. And for example, that's what we do internally. Uh, we use a Terraform controller or provider to enforce roles on GitHub. So we use GitHub and we use a provider with infrastructure as code to enforce roles on GitHub. Um, so it's very hard for somebody to uh, get additional permissions that lets them remove security features without leaving an audit trail a mile long and, and flagging up a whole bunch of alarms in the process. Uh, monitor audit log, access log, key changes log. Key changes are, are really important. Your uh, accepted key um, on the side of the provider uh, are basically the keys to the kingdom. So audit the changes uh, uh, of uh, the change log for those keys. Uh, the good thing is that change log is actually much smaller uh, than the, the one you would have to audit otherwise. And manually verify commits to master, right? Have a, have a human in the loops. Humans are good at picking up really weird things that machines might not. Have a human in the loop to verify commits to master. And, and finally, don't use deprecated software, right? Use up-to-date software. I mean, that goes without saying, but you'd be surprised. Um, so Git itself is updated very often, very frequently. Uh, you'll want to use the latest version because it mitigates a whole bunch of vulnerabilities. And, and that's it. That's, the, that's kind of the, the, the gist of um, this side of the conversation, which is how do you secure your pipeline when you have immutable artifacts that you know are good? And I think uh, Simon now is going to talk about how do you make sure that those artifacts are good, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's correct. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bryce. And, and um, 
uh, yeah, I, I feel I feel that there's two parts to this. One of one of which is the kind of content they're actually going to be putting in, and another one is the uh, the, the the actual uh, you know the securing of, of Git itself. And there's a, there's a number of um, additional things that I'm going to talk about. One of which uh, is actually going to start if I share my screen. In fact, um, oh, there we go. Cool. So if I share my screen over here, um, the first one I'm going to um, talk about, uh, so hopefully you can see my, uh, my Git Secrets panel there. Um, the first thing I'm going to talk about is something called Git Secrets. And it's amazing, actually, uh, if you were to look in many uh, Git repositories, how many secrets are available uh, in GitHub these days and in, different, in various projects. Uh, and this is actually very, very easy to, uh, to, to, to search for. Um, but I want to talk about Git Secrets first, and then we'll have a quick check. So Git Secrets is a a, um, is a tool that actually you can run um, and it's actually uh, runs as webhooks as well on perhaps things like commits and it looks for a number of different uh, different artifacts within that commit or within those repositories um, that it would con that it would consider uh, to be a secret and it can you can effectively use it as a git hook that would that would uh, halt uh, a commit halt a pull request based on the fact that it believes uh, secrets to be there so if I was to come out of this actually in fact and go to github right now I can come across to github and look do something like like uh, removed password It's a classic example. If I was to do a search there, I can see that we have 471,000 commits of people that just have removed password. And there's two things here, in fact. One is that it's amazing what people will actually write in a commit. Uh, yes, commit messages are good, but when you actually broadcast the fact that you've put secrets in, uh, that's another thing entirely. And the second thing is, uh, while we do look at, um, at, at you know, trying to make sure that we do contain, uh, ho you know, hold on to our history and things like that, as Bryce was talking about, there are some things in our history that we don't want to necessarily keep. And one of those is when we have secrets. And if we have committed secrets in, uh, in our repositories in the past, we don't necessarily want to keep those secrets uh, in those repositories. And this is, uh, you know, twofold. One, because, uh, you know, first of all, it, it, it's bad to just have people will find you as a result of this. And secondly, because those passwords, I'm sure people don't share passwords, but you know, if, if there are shared passwords or anything like that, then you could put others at risk as well. So, you know, in, in terms of the number of, uh, of secrets that exist, uh, this is the classic example, but secrets do exist in your, in your runtime. So make sure uh, that you're using tools uh, that can look for them. There are another couple of tools, um, uh, called uh, one is called Git Rob and one is called Truffle Hog, uh, which can also audit your uh, runtimes. So do check them out as well, in, in, which will provide you with a full uh, full audit as well. Um, but the one that I'm going to talk about a little bit more in depth today is is one which is certainly dear to our hearts at SNCC, um, which is in and around your application dependencies. Um, we're going to talk about how um, your dependencies can indeed contain uh, security vulnerabilities. And this is way, way more important when we actually think about how uh, people have access to GitHub or Git or any, any kind of repository which you're going to be using. Because what we want to do is we want to make it harder for people to actually add vulnerabilities into your source code and provide Provide, have uh, GitHub or whatever your repository exists have that as your single point of, of you know true security. So if we can if we can make sure that as pull requests and commits are created that uh, they are currently being they are being tested and audited at that stage to see if new vulnerabilities are being added. That's what we want to uh, that's what we want to address. So. You know, open question here, do, we, do, do, we, do you know which dependencies you have? And a lot of people will think straight away, yeah, of course I know which dependencies I have. But, you know, realistically, when we think about it, your application is extremely large and your, your code that you're going to be writing is very, very small in comparison to your application. Um, typically, uh, many, many people will think that their application is going to be the code or the, the, the code that someone writes is going to be the place where the vulnerabilities are going to exist. But typically, the application that you deploy, which contains many known, well-used well libraries, are going to have known vulnerabilities all listed in these wonderful uh, databases that, that uh, list these vulnerabilities very, 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 very nicely. Now, this vulnerabilities, these vulnerabilities are going to exist there, and they have existed there for some time. But the issue isn't so much that the, uh, the vulnerabilities aren't being uh, addressed by the maintainers because they are and they're being released typically very, very uh, quickly after they've been announced or certainly uh, uh, um, you know, been 
told the, 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 to the maintainers that, that they exist. But typically the problem is that application developers aren't pulling in the right versions. So every single dependency is a security risk um, and not just the direct dependencies, because when we think about our application having a list of dependencies, we think those dependencies are typically small. Um, but NPM inception, uh, NPM is always given a hard time of, of or, you know, for the number of dependencies that exist. Um, but typically, we, we need to go deeper than just the direct dependencies because a simple application like this, and NPM, yes, is, is given a hard, hard, hard go of it, but we'll typically have a larger number of dependencies. In this case, we have a smaller number of direct dependencies, but actually 410 uh, dependencies in total with very many paths going from, from uh, you know, e e through each of those transitives. So we have a large number of dependencies. We have a large number of direct and transitive dependencies. How do we know which, um, which of those dependencies have been audited, both direct and transitive? How do we know the security expertise of the maintainers? How do we know if any of those have, have received any security testing? We love making sure our own code is secure, but how can, we, how can we make sure that the code that we are deploying, both ours and our uh, uh, third-party libraries, are vulnerability-free, or at least uh, with so few of known vulnerabilities that exist that we are comfortable putting them into, into production. So let's go terminal and I'll show you uh, a couple of examples. The first example I'm actually going to show you, we're going to take it, uh, take the stage back and actually run, so do, do a couple of, um, do a couple of hacks first of all. I'm just going to move this down there. Right, so I'm gonna, we're going to do a couple of hacks first of all. And uh, once we've done a little bit of hacking, we can show um, how we can, uh, how we can remove the, the the vulnerabilities from that environment and how we can actually stop us adding those vulnerabilities into into git as well so i'm going to show you uh, a, a couple of typical uh, vulnerability examples uh, the first one's going to be a directory traversal vulnerability this is uh, my very very simple goof to do application uh, we also have an about page which is a very modest about page we can see this about page is actually being hosted via the public uh, directory now i've already in fact um, done a scan of this project and this this piece here is our is the SNCC UI so this is where we do scans of your existing uh, code from within github um, this isn't necessarily this is almost a little bit late in terms of the in terms of stopping developers from pushing their pushing their new dependencies or their code into their repositories but at this stage we're going to look at uh, how we can actually find the vulnerabilities that we already have I'm going to do a search actually for directory traversal. This is directory traversal in the ST module, which is a module that serves static content. So knowing this, I'm going to go back to my application uh, here, and I'm going to curl this HTML uh, page. I'm going to do that from a terminal. So I'm going to just going to go ahead and curl this page, and you'll see that this application is is uh, you know extremely versatile. The 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 application looks just as good here in my in my uh, curl environment as uh, in my terminal as it will do in my runtime. But what we're going to do is a directory traversal. Directory traversal is typically doing a dot dot slash. Doing a directory traversal like this won't actually work because this is going to send us directly to our home page. And this is because ST is a real library and ST recognizes that we're trying to do a directory traversal here. So rather than put the dots, I'm going to URL encode this to a percent to e percent to e. And at this stage, we can actually achieve our directory traversal. So with this is with this application. Our code is fairly secure. We're not actually attacking our application code. We're attacking the code of the ST library, which we have pulled in. Now at this stage, I can actually just copy paste this and we can go all the way down. Actually, what I could do, in fact, if I wanted to, is I could just copy this package JSON and view my package JSON. I can actually just curl files on the, on the file system. Instead of going to the package JSON, uh, I can go up to um, the root directory which I can do does by just doing that many, 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 many times. There's my root directory. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a look at my uh, etc password direct, um, file. This is my, accept, my etc password file. So I can start looking at sensitive information on, on my file system. Classic example of a, uh, of a directory traversal and how damaging it can be to, for, for an attacker to then start looking at whatever information they want within the permission restrictions uh, that they have. So. Um, what we can do now is we can uh, eliminate this vulnerability and we can eliminate this very, very easily just by coming in here um, and just by fixing this vulnerability. Uh, and on this fix, uh, it's going to 
uh, here, fix this directory traversal in ST. This fix is going to uh, open a fixed pull request. Now, that what this is going to do now is it's going to actually not just provide you with the vulnerability uh, that you know that exists there but it's also going to fix that vulnerability so it's going to provide you with the remediation you need so if I click on files changed we can see that the ST vulnerability here has been uh, has been increased uh, from uh, version 024 to 025 and this is the minimum increase you need in order to eliminate that vulnerability now, one thing I also wanted to show is uh, how we can actually do that in a pipeline. Now, many of you are familiar with maybe with more of the CI/CD pipelines, whereby you know you push things all the way through, and then that the, the you know the, the CD part that pushes over to uh, production. And we've already discussed. Bryce has already covered a few reasons why that might not be uh, ideal for some people. Now, one of the things that we can do here is I can run a test, and that test can effectively query the vulnerability database, the SNCC vulnerability database, and look at the, all the vulnerabilities that exist. Now, these vulnerabilities aren't just um, NVD database vulnerabilities or CVE database vulnerabilities, which are the common vulnerabilities which other scanner uh, tools, which you know, typically come uh, built in with other, other vendors, maybe things like NPM audit and things like that. But this also is, has a large number of proprietary, uh, well, not proprietary, but non-public uh, vulnerabilities, as well as others that are researched by our research team and other research uh, areas around the, uh, around the world. Um, and we also do scrapes of, of GitHub and Git uh, repositories for uh, vulnerability texts that exist in both uh, both your uh, your issues as well as your comments as well. So when we think about um, vulnerabilities that exist in a database, I'll give you an example here: the npm database, for example, or the npm uh, list of vulnerabilities that exist in the SNCC database. Only thirteen percent, one three percent of those have associated CVs uh, with them. So this this tool here the SNCC test tool here would allow us to stop a ci cd pipeline but what do we do how do we stop this earlier we want to shift everything further left well when i come back to this uh, pull request which was created uh if i come back to the uh whoops not that bit uh, if i come back to the conversation one of the things that we see at the bottom here is and if i refresh this uh one of the things that we'll see here is that we have a number of tests that are that are um, that are executed against every single uh, CI sorry every single pull request. Now these tests can um, check both that no licenses or no security vulnerabilities have been added that violate any policies that we have. So essentially, what we can do is we can now continue to merge this pull request, knowing and understanding that the delta change in this pull request has not introduced any new vulnerabilities or not introduce any new uh, license issues uh, that we know are gonna be against our policy. If I give you a, a, an example of um, something that has happened here whereby tests have not been successful, here in this case we can continue to merge this pull request, but you can set it up in your, in, you know, your environment to state that if these tests fails, I'm gonna actually block this merge or you need a specific admin uh, to block this merge. And of course then if I was to go on to the details of this, you can see the new vulnerability paths or new vulnerabilities that are going to exist as a result of this pull request. So the, the kind of git hooks that exist as a result you know, are not just used by you know, certain tools, they're used by git secrets as an example, they're used by SNCC as an example. Um, other security testing that you can do would be things like Sonacube or, or, or Code Climate um, for some automated code reviews or, or code quality testing. Um, we can run a whole number of tests uh, that run as, as, as Git hooks that can provide us with the information we need uh, and also uh, provide us with the, uh, with the uh, knowledge that we're not introducing, we're not regressing any additions. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of other things. Um, I'm going to go over to, uh, let's see, this, no, not this one, this um, repository here. This is the Apache Storm um, uh, repository, which uh, has this security MD file. I want to talk just briefly about what a security MD file is. Uh, a security MD file is something which will highlight security related information uh, for this project or for this um, uh, for, for this. 
uh, repository. And a security MD file can have a number of different things. We would suggest um, that you have a security uh, a disclosure policy, a security update policy, a security related configuration information, as well as any known security gaps or, or future enhancements that you're going to want as part of your as part of your repository. So, for example, a, a disclosure policy is is something which will determine how someone who is using your repository can actually disclose specific. Uh, new vulnerabilities. That's, it's, an ama it's amazing how many people don't actually realize how to disclose a vulnerability in a specific project because they don't obviously want to push that information uh, public. So how does someone actually do that? Perhaps you want maybe some, some um, if you want a specific uh, responsible disclosure process or if you want a, a security at uh, style mailing list which you can push uh, those kind of uh, requests through. And if you were to have that, your chances of a, of, of um, actually getting those security notifications actually increased by three to four times. Um, also having a, an update policy about your security news. If you were to, if you had as, as a project owner, you had some security news, how do you then uh, project that to your, to your runtime, to, sorry, to your, uh, your users? How as a user can you get notified of security information about uh, the projects that you use? Um, if there are specific uh, security configuration, and this is, uh, this is an important one for, uh, for the Apache Storm, there's a whole bunch of information here about how you might want to set up uh, your, for example, your authentication, uh, certificates, generating certificates, how you can set up authentication with Kerberos. There's a whole bunch of different ways in which this can be achieved, uh, and, and providing this in a security MD file helps your users adopt that securely. Um, and finally, if there are known security gaps, uh, it's, there are known security gaps in every project, but knowing about that may even alert you to how you can run it in certain, uh, in certain, form, in certain ways and know you're running securely, whereas others, at least you know where you're insecure. And as a project, um, it really helps others help you by saying that we know we're not as secure as we want to be here. Can we uh, can we be more secure? Um, there's a whole bunch of other things, into, you know, that that we can also add to the platform. And Bryce mentioned a few of them. Uh, a couple of others uh, would be, you know, obviously making sure your 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 GitHub repos have tight control access, including. Uh, your, your usual two-phase uh, authentication, making sure your GitHub applications that you do choose to use um, have, the right have the right access rights. I know GitHub and other repositories aren't necessarily as granular as they could be in terms of allowing that kind of access you know, more granularly, um, but making sure that the author's credibility uh, the the author of the of the application has enough credibility uh, that you know you're not just uh, adding some application in uh, from a new author how, who has uh, no background uh, at all. Uh, a number of other things in terms of we talked about keys, rotating your SSH keys, uh, your personal access tokens, all those kind of things. Uh, obviously. The, the, the typical security behavior that you would need to do, um, but it's more and more important uh, in, in, a, in a GitOps environment by applying that to your, to your repository. Um, and uh, one final thing is um, that I wanted to mention as well is how we not just when you know we think about this being a pipeline, security isn't something that stays still. And as and when we push to uh, to our final uh, environment, so you know whatever production uh, or environment we have, we want to know that that environment isn't just secure at the moment of pushing, but it's actually also secure in a week's time or two weeks time. There are no new known vulnerabilities or no new remediations which we can take, um, which, which you know, will automatically, uh, we can apply to our environment. And, and one of the things here that we, uh, we can provide as well is um, notifications via pull requests to both new um, ways of fixing, new fixes, and also new vulnerabilities. So you'll get a SNCC alert if a new vulnerability appears that, uh, that you need to either remediate or at least know about uh, it being existing in your, in your environment. And that'll appear as a, as a pull request directly into your, into your uh, Git environment. And the second way is actually for new fixes. So if, for example, we are providing a patch, whereas an, uh, an, and a new update uh, appears, which you can use, instead, we will provide you with a pull request which can say, um, you know, jumping to this, uh, to this new update, you can uh, you can be more secure and more up to date with that uh, with that latest version. Um, so that's everything I I had there. I've got a couple of questions I can see here. One from Scott. 
uh, about where did the name SNCC come from? Uh, SNCC actually comes from it's uh, so now you know S N Y K. There's a certain irony in that uh, in that in that no no one really knows that that is what SNCC stands for. But uh, but so now you know that's where SNCC comes from. Um, and there's another question here from Jeremy Cohen. Uh, doesn't GitHub already alert you? Uh, when your application contains libraries with vulnerabilities. Yes, um, in fact, it's great that there is a number of tools which actually already do this, and Git has, has done really well in actually alerting. Um, there are obviously a number of different ways in which uh, it, it can go further, one of which is, uh, first of all, the, the vulnerability database, like I said, our vulnerability, the SNCC vulnerability database and others um, actually contain more vulnerability. So it's important to get that, that really good vulnerability content as your database. Um, and also secondly, going understanding the vulnerabilities is just is just one environment. Uh, you can you, what you also want to oh, sorry one uh, one part of understanding where your problems exist. What you really want to do is actually be able to uh, push that and say push it further and say how can I remediate? So if I was to come here and look at um, look at our dependencies, uh, you'll, actually not this one, so if I go back to my projects and I look at my, uh, I'm on the wrong, I'm gonna go here. Uh, if I look at my projects here and I go to all projects and I go to that goof uh, uh, project now, uh, one of the things that we want to know is not just, uh, you know, not just where your vulnerabilities exist, but where they exist, whether they're a direct dependency or a, 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 a transitive dependency. Um, and and that, that, that is really key in terms of, you know, knowing not just where your vulnerability exists, but the different paths through. So we have 33 vulnerabilities here via 68 paths. So understanding the, the, detailed, uh, the detailed information about the dependency tree and then how to fix, because there may be various fixes. And the fixes that we put in here, for example, this body parser with the QS uh, transitive, if I go to find that remediation, the remediation will likely be, uh, where is it? Let's have a look quickly for the QS. Uh, here it is, the QS vulnerable module. The remediation here, some will have remediation, some may not, uh, but the remediation here is to actually upgrade body parser to version 117.1, which will pull QS in at a non-vulnerable version. So that, that helps as well. Um, one of the questions, one of the other questions was about, uh, um, one of the other questions was about will it work with Bitbucket, it will work with Git, um, uh, Git repository, so Bitbucket, uh, being Git repository will, will, will also um, uh, support uh, Bitbucket Cloud or Bitbucket Server, uh, GitHub, GitLab, and others. Um, I want to, uh, rather than go through those questions, uh, I want to I want to go back to Sonia just to make sure we don't have other questions as well that need answering, but I'm happy to carry on with those. Yeah, sounds good, Simon. Thank you. Um, there's a couple more questions that came in. Um, one of the latest ones, one, how does GitOps work with DevQI environments? Yeah, so maybe I should take that one. So um, in terms of how do you work with DevQA, you've got several options. So we internally, for example, we have a QA environment. And the way we've done this is we have created a subfolder in the same repository. You could also work with uh, either separate repositories or separate branches of the same repository or separate folder in the same branch. Um, so you've got kind of a bunch of options around that. We found that the single repository, single branch, different folders uh, work the best for our workflows, lets us use our tools across both environments and compare the two very easily. Uh, but I guess that's kind of how it's, uh, it best works for you. I hope that answers your question, uh, Benji. Thank you. And then Simon, there was another one in the chat as well. How does Nick have USP over Twistlock and Aquasec or Nessus, or is it a different space you're posing? Yeah, sure. And then as a follow-up of that, can Snick be used as an internal setup as well, or does it have to leave the organization? Yep. Uh, so the first question about uh, about Twistlock and uh, Twistlock and Aqua. Um, so Snick, everything I've shown you right now is is very um, is looking at static manifest files. Um, so the static manifest files we are looking very very early on, whereas some of the some of those other competitors that I mentioned are more runtime focused. Um, so more looking at your runtime environments and, and things like that, and looking at how you know Docker containers and things like that are, are working in your runtime. Uh, we also have a Docker container support as well. So if you wanted to do if you wanted to scan your Docker images uh, for both uh, for both package and um, 
uh, and Docker base image uh, vulnerabilities, we can actually scan the image. So we're not scanning the container in your runtime there, we're scanning your image and we can provide you remediations on your, both your packages as well as your base images. So the, the, there's a subtlety in, in how, we're, how we're working differently at that stage there. Um, and sorry, the second question, Sonia? The second question was, can Slate be used as an internal setup, um, yeah. like not cloud-based and does it have to leave the organization? Yeah, so uh, everything I showed you today, in fact, everything I showed you here is actually free. I should have mentioned that to start off with, that we have a number of different pricing plans. Um, if you're open source, you can use that entirely free. Uh, you ha also have 200 tests a month uh, for closed source for free. Um, so you can go away and test everything that, like that for free. Everything I've shown you is the SaaS version. If you wanted more of an on-prem version, so you're actually running within your organization, we do have an enterprise license in which you can uh, effectively run everything I've shown you on-prem, literally unplug your, your cables and everything will still work. You will need to have, uh, to have our SNCC uh, vulnerability database uh, on your on, on premises as well. So you just need to make sure that your uh, vulnerability database is up to date with ours as we do update hours um, sometimes several times a day. So it's uh, it's important to keep to keep on top of that. Awesome. I've got a question for you, Simon. Actually, one of the things that uh, strikes me is that the, the the big thing when you switch on those security scanning is you tend to get a lot. So how do you prioritize in practice? How do you prioritize the vulnerability and and do you do things like you know, sharing for the, the risk per vulnerability to kind of help the developers prioritize their work? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question, actually. And triaging is one of, is always one of the big, big kind of problems that, uh, that, you know, people have when they think about security, because, you know, very often um, you get offered a huge, great list of vulnerabilities and it's like, okay, where do I start? So, it, it, you know, if, we, if you were to look at some of the vulnerability information that we provide, um, we can provide obviously high, medium, low said vulnerabilities. Uh, we also have a, um, that we provide all the CVSS scores within the vulnerability itself and you can also see the number of different paths. So you can see some are very easy to remediate uh, and some of those have minor upgrades as well. So you can almost triage based on, first of all, how easy it is to remediate because some are very, very quick, very, very easy minor, uh, minor upgrades that aren't going to affect your application. Others are going to need greater code changes, so you can then start considering you know, how much effort is going to, is going to take and then you know, how exploitable you are. And, and very often that's done on an application by application basis because it depends sometimes how they're used. Um, we also have something else coming out, which is uh, something which will be running in, uh, in runtime. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at vulnerable methods, and this is actually available as an open beta now. Um, it's going to be looking at the runtime to see which vulnerable methods are actually being uh, executed. So as and when, a vulnerable method, a vulnerability is, you know, that path, the actual method is being executed, you can get a notification to say, this code path has just been executed. And as a result, that really helps with the triaging to state, okay, this code is actually being run in my environment. Uh, this is something, you know, that I, that I might need to, you know, increase on the triage uh, to make sure that we look at it very, very quickly. Awesome. Okay, I think we're at the end actually, guys. Thank you so much. Um, thank you all for the participants. We will send out the slides. We will send out the recording so you have that. Um, and have all a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you all. Goodbye.